welcome. I think we'll get started. I'll share my screen again in a little bit, but uh, I want to be able to, to see you all. So um, welcome to all prospective students. I'm Kelly Kidwell. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Biostatistics at the University of Michigan. I'm also newly the associate chair of academic affairs and the admissions chair. Um, we're so excited that you're able to virtually join us today. We used to do this event in person and it's actually been quite um, a, a great experience. This is a good part of the pandemic that we've got to move this online and we get to connect with so many more of you um, all around the world than we ever could do in person. So we had people sign up from all over and it's just really, really exciting here. We have a global community in our department um, in, at Michigan Biostatistics, and we just really hope to impart that feeling of community to you tonight. So we have an excellent and very full agenda um, for us all. Our goal is to introduce our wonderful and, and maybe wild world of biostatistics to you and to tell you about the University of Michigan so that you can decide if it would be a great fit for you. We sure hope that you feel that way after tonight. We'll have our incredibly talented chair, Dr. Ramar Mukherjee, open up with a message and then I'll elaborate on our programs and admissions. Not to sell Ramar and myself short, um, but I think you're probably here for the students. So that will be the majority of our program tonight. You'll get to hear from our really talented masters and PhD students so they can tell you from a student perspective about how great our program is and how great Ann Arbor is. Um, please note that at any time, even though there's a specific Q&A section with the, with the students, at any time if you have questions, please speak up, either just speak up and, and ask, or feel free to use the chat. Um, we'll be sure to check the chat as we go and make sure that we either respond to you in the chat or we'll repeat your question and respond um, out loud. So um, at 8.30, our formal experience will end but you'll find information on our website and we'll put it in the chat later about meeting with various faculty and students in Zoom sessions. So you can exit out of this Zoom session and go into other Zoom sessions as you, um, as you feel. And you can just pop in and out of them as, as you'd like. It's very informal, very casual. You can say a few words, listen to, you know, ask questions or just listen to what's going on and then move on to somebody else if you'd like. Um, so, in order to keep with our schedule, um, I'd like to move it along and pass the baton to our chair, Dr. Bramar Mukherjee. Thank you, Kelly, and thanks everyone. I am so delighted to be welcoming you all uh, from my home. And so to from my home to yours, uh, warm vibe and good wishes. I wanted to make sure that like, you know, to tell you a little bit about the department. And uh, before I begin, I just want to thank everyone, each and every one uh, from our department staff and faculty and students who are participating tonight. And you can see that as Kelly said that I and Kelly are just going to get things started, but you're going to hear the real truth from our uh, fabulous students. And then you're, if you have signed up for faculty meetings, you're going to hear from some faculty as well. So uh, I want to tell you, I don't need to sell you on Ann Arbor. Uh, Ann Arbor is a fabulous town and it, the sky is always blue and the sun is always shining like you see in the Picture. This is one of my favorite areas in Ann Arbor where you can see two theaters, uh, Michigan Theater and State Theater, uh, where which is wonderful avenues for performing arts as well as movies and you can see the iconic bell tower as well. Uh, so I want to tell you a little bit about the School of Public Health because many of you are coming from a background in mathematics, many of you are you coming from a background in biology, some of you have engineering and you're just puzzling and thinking and reflecting on what is biostatistics and what is the School of Public Health. So we have six departments in the School of Public Health and you can see them listed here. 
uh, biostatistics and epidemiology are one of the larger departments and then environmental health, health behavior, health education, health management and policy and nutritional sciences are other departments. I want to mention that our Dean it's, uh, himself is a biostatistician, so incredibly lucky. And uh, as you can see, we, the chairs club, the six departmental chairs, we call us uh, ourselves the rocking chairs and all of us are uh, female right now. So we, we are just a proud group of people leading uh, the school into new domains and new territories. And uh, in the department, we also have strong leadership. And as you can see that in my second term as chair, I'm joined by uh, Kelly Kidwell and Lu Wang as our associate chairs. And we make a fabulous team of, we always call, uh, talk about girl power. Uh, and also important work is being done in diversity, equity, and inclusion under the leadership of Laura Scott, as well as Pei Song Han, and also Professor Mike Benke, who is our graduate program director. So our department is actually a fusion of work of many, many people. And so because of the pandemic, we are so scattered, I decided to put a picture of all of us together. And you can see uh, that we have one of the largest, uh, finest and kindest biostatistic departments in the world with 41 primary faculty members and a lot of students. 230 students which define the tapestry and quilt of our life coming from different parts of the world. And as uh, Kelly mentioned, that we are very, very happy and grateful that our program is known all over the world and we provide world-class training in biostatistics to students and scholars coming from all over the world. And uh, this international spirit is very much at the core of our mission. So what is our mission? Our mission is has many, many different aspects. The first thing is that our training and educational program, providing training to the next generation of world-class biostatisticians and our graduate flag, our flagship graduate program. And then of course our research, also bringing principled biostatistical design and analysis to other biomedical research that goes on in campus. That's a big part of our job. And we are committed to really thinking about the data science workforce and uh, increase the representation of groups that have been historically excluded and marginalized in our profession. So together to sum up, we really try to represent and thrive uh, to be an intellectually vibrant and socially progressive community who are trying to use data to improve human health. So many of you are grappling with whether statistics or biostatistics, this is where we are quite distinct from a statistics department because most of our work is actually related to improving human health. Uh, we have very strong pillars of strength in terms of areas of biostatistics, and some are classical, some are emerging areas like causal inference, machine learning, big data, uh, data integration, electronic health records, uh, mobile health. These are some of the newly uh, new areas which are emerging in biostatistics due to changes in uh, growth of biomedical data and technology. And then traditionally, we have been extremely strong in clinical trials, in genetics and genomics, uh, in longitudinal data, survival data, survey methodology, uh, because Michigan has one of the world-class institute, Institute of Social Research in survey methodology. So these are an, an uh, imaging analysis. This is our classical areas of strength. So one good thing about being in Michigan biostatistics is that it's so big that if you're stuck on a problem, you can knock on the door or just send a message and you can find an expertise in-house. Uh, sometimes we often forget because we always talk about our goals, we forget our values. But here in academia, we are here to improve our learning, improve our education and grow as learners. And so we strongly encourage bold exploration of ideas. We believe in purposeful inclusion. We work towards greater good. Uh, instead of a competitive spirit, we really want to embrace a collaborative vision of science. We are very determined but we also are very mindful of our well-being. So since this is a message from the chair, you're going to hear the student's perspective. You're going to hear from Kelly, who is, uh, I'm very grateful to her for uh, looking after our admissions and graduate program um, this year. 
And so department chair, what does a department chair do? So the department chair obviously have to, has to keep the trains running, make sure that people are going to classes and uh, there are no two classes scheduled at the same time, taught by the same faculty members and things like that. But then department chair also creates new directions and destinations. And I'd like to share with some, with some of the things that I have done uh, in the last, so this is my fourth year as department chair. I just started my second term. What have we done and what is different in Michigan biostatistics? So, uh, and um, just to uh, really quote that famous line that if I can see farther, it's by standing on the shoulders of these giants. So I just want to thank all my previous chairs who have gotten this department, which was founded in 1949 to this point. So when I first became chair three years ago, uh, most of my initiatives were very student focused. It related to the curriculum, it related to computing, it related to culture, uh, and also involved students in departmental governance and make sure that the biostatistics mafia is everywhere so that in the campus there is every project in biomedical science has principled and rigorous biostatistical design and analysis. So um, some of the new things, and, and you'll hear more about this as the evening goes by, is that we have a new sub plan in health data science, which we are planning to develop into an independent master's program as well in a couple of years. But this has really, uh, in, in infused our program uh, and enriched the training of our students with lots of additional computing courses, for example, are with big data, machine learning, and also embedded case studies in data intensive research, uh, in data integration, electronic health records, in genetics, in imaging studies. We also have online presence. Faculty also teach an MPH, uh, online MPH and MS uh, with Coursera and these are degrees in public health. So we have a biostatistics specialization there. We also have a wonderful summer program. Our, uh, I, some of you probably have attended this or heard about this. Uh, it is in its sixth year. We just completed the last year on Zoom virtually. And over the last six iterations, we have trained more than 247 students and 60% or more are in graduate schools all over the world. So we are very proud of this program. Um, we walk, tried to walk the talk when three years ago, we decided that we are going to have a more computational focus, a data science focus. So we have in-house resources for Linux computing, advanced research computing, cluster computing. We also have our package development support because as statisticians, you might come up with a brilliant method, but your method has to be usable for that. We need translation of the method into usable softwares and packages. So if you go to our website and click on our softwares, then you will see that there are many 120 or more packages now uh, that are developed by faculty and students in the department, which are used for analysis of biomedical data routinely. And you can uh, group the packages, look at them by a faculty member or also by topics, for example, genetics or survival analysis. Uh, along with all the intellectual work that we do, we are also very mindful of, as I said, well-being and wellness and the COVID-19. If anything, it has taught us that it is extremely important to take care of ourselves and our surroundings. Uh, we do have an in-house support, uh, in the biostatistics student inclusion advocate and wellness advocate, Andrea Hill, that it, who is always happy to talk to the biostatistics students, be it a stressful examination or a lull in your PhD dissertation, Andrea is always there to help uh, and talk through um, different issues and challenges. Uh, so I think that we, our goal is to not just to produce uh, very strong students and intellectually and uh, very well-trained technically, but also uh, really make them happier in terms of the holistic sense of life. And so we have a very thriving program and thriving student body, and you're going to hear from many of them. They have their own activities. I have listed some of them here, uh, but also there is a focus on learning more about diversity, equity, and inclusion as it reflects on our profession. For example, what is the research that biostatistics faculty doing, which represents that we are uh, working on very important problems related to representation. 
And so last year, students organized this uh, DEI seminar where you really address research issues. These are research talks which are very relevant uh, to enhancing the mission of um, inclusion in data science and in biostatistics. Similarly, when COVID-19 happened, faculty quickly pivoted and made seminal contributions. And not just that, students rose to the challenge. For example, Holly Hartman, who is actually trained by Dr. Kidwell uh, but, um, yeah, and other faculty in the department as well, uh, created this app, which is estimating that the delay in cancer care, what are the costs uh, uh, to a cancer patient in terms of survival benefits? Professor Song's lab produced a software that was an analyzed, uh, that was used to analyze many um, COVID trajectory in many countries. So we have 22 faculty members involved in 40 different projects. And there is a cross collaboration across the labs. For example, uh, this package that I mentioned to model the transmission dynamics of COVID-19 in Wuhan uh, that was developed by the Song lab was used by my lab to produce a very timely paper that was um, quoted as a critical piece of evidence behind India's national lockdown. Similarly, we have used the electronic health records at Michigan to show that even in our own hospital, racial disparities exist in terms of COVID outcomes. And as I mentioned, that this is the paper by Holly Hartman, uh, which is the calculator that she built in terms of uh, evaluating the delay in cancer care. So all of our work has really garnered tremendous media attention with about 1300 media clips generated during the COVID year last year with a reach of 6.3 billion. So we really pursued impact and also uh, speak our vision, speak our values through our science. So in my second term as chair, I want to focus on three initiatives. Uh, we have come a long way in terms of the, the six initiatives that I showed you and those that the bucket of work is going to continue. But then uh, in the second term, I want to focus on three initiatives with three acronyms, C change, M plus, and I lead. So I really want to call for climate change because we have gone through a lot in society and this pandemic has changed our viewpoint as well. And we need to really come together as a world and really try to make some impact. Uh, M plus mentoring, better mentoring of students and faculty and staff at every level there, one could learn from your mentors and one could use a good listener. Uh, and also leadership. Leadership does not start at a, with a named position. Leadership can be at any domain. So how do we grow leadership? So if you are thinking about many other different programs and many other, uh, other like, you know, choices by statistics, statistics, all the departments are very strong. We are blessed to have a very uh, thriving community. But we are special because we have journey lectures where uh, people talk about their childhood and how they figured out why they wanted to be a biostatistician. So you can see some of the flyers and you can see cool baby pictures of faculty. And we also are extremely good in writing plays and acting. So here you can see that Dr. Kidwell and me and our chair, Professor Rod Little, former chair, um, is working on a skit. And this skit is actually very relevant now. It is about vaccines and what are the hesitations in people. If you have a chance, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel. We do have a YouTube channel, Michigan Biostatistics, and you can see all the fun stuff there. I'm not going to play this. And I'm just going to tell you that this is a, and a, you can watch that and you, at your own leisure time. I just wanted to show you that we do other kind of fun stuff with respect to statistical communication, scientific communication, and just for having pure fun. Uh, so I, we also have a departmental anthem. And so uh, it is written in the spirit of grand old flag. And if you want to hear our uh, anthem, you can go to the YouTube link and it's also in our website. Uh, we are Biostat, Michigan is where we are at. So I just want to show you this little feel good movie that our students and staff put together to conclude my welcome message. But I really want to thank you for taking your time this afternoon, this morning, this evening, wherever you are in the world uh, to take your, uh, to listen to us to take an interest in biostatistics as a profession and in particular Michigan biostatistics. So I'm going to play the video. Love me.
Michigan by statistics because of the fun and the intellectual banter that I have with my students and colleagues. What do I love about Michigan Biostats? I love the people and their passion. I love that we work hard and we laugh a lot. And I love that we dependably try to be our best in everything that we do for the department and the school. You're gonna wake up every day excited about what you're learning about and the people you're learning or working with. And you're gonna to go to bed feeling the same way. I thoroughly enjoy interacting with our gifted students in and out of the classroom, learning from and working with my exceedingly bright colleagues and collaborating with experts on novel projects in various areas. What I find most inspiring about Michigan Biostats is the zeal with which faculty, students, and staff use knowledge and data towards creating a healthy world. I chose Michigan Biostatistics because of its top-notch research reputation and the wide variety of research topics that faculty are working on that I could join in. Why Michigan Biostats? because we have faculty with diverse interests and expertise. It's a fun place to learn, a vibrant campus, and we have friendly folks in the department. So go Blue. So thanks everyone, and I'm happy to take any questions and also hang out for the remainder, remaining part and uh, send your questions by chat. Thank you so much, Ramar. If you do go on to YouTube and watch that video, please do not judge my acting skills. They're subpar at best. She's um, very good in that skill, I can tell you. Skitty, I can tell you. <laughs> but it is pretty fun and funny. All right. So I would like to tell you a little bit more about our program and the admissions process. Um, and hopefully, answer any questions that you might have about the application and give you a few tips as well. So you're all here, you probably know already about biostatistics, but just to clarify, right, biostatisticians develop and apply statistical designs and analysis methods for biomedical research to turn data into knowledge. We at Michigan Biostatistics, we're one of the best among the world in what we do. We have so many amazing faculty and students that are just really doing great things across a wide variety of areas. Our graduates obtain interesting and well-paid jobs, both our masters and PhD graduates. All of our PhD students are fully funded, meaning that their tuition is paid for, they receive a stipend and health insurance. And many of our master's students are actually fully supported as well, which makes us a bit different from other programs. Our master's and our PhD programs combine theory, methods, computing, and application. So if you're thinking about what area is best for me, is it statistics, is it biostatistics, is it computer science, is it bioinformatics, we give you a bit of everything in the best way possible. Biostatistics is truly such an exciting field in which you can use your math. So if many of you are coming from a math background, this is just such a phenomenal application and use of those math skills. Vermar really touched on these, but I just wanna spend another minute going over these um, facts and figures. We're one of the larger biostatistics programs out there. We currently have 230 residential students 133 of those are our master's students and 97 are our PhD students. We have 41 faculty that help to support the learning, the mentoring, the advising of those students and are working side by side and really making amazing research, uh, uh, amazing research papers and, and advances. We have a really great network of 2000 alumni out there who are really eager to see you succeed and to hire you. And so many of our faculty are so productive and world experts in what they're doing, bringing in millions of research dollars, um, getting funding the students, funding their research. We have over $38 million in annual research funds. So we're incredibly productive but Department of Biostatistics. Our department is within the School of Public Health from our showed those amazing rocking chairs um, of the other programs in our school. We're all housed together in two buildings. Um, we see each other and we do collaborate and you can take courses um, from what any of those other School of Public Health 
uh, departments as well as anywhere in the University of Michigan. So in terms of your application, our admissions process is really based on your math background, your grade point average, letters of recommendation that we're really looking for academic letters. So understanding, getting individuals to write letters from about your math and quantitative background and a statement of purpose. For our programs, we require that you have as prerequisites, multivariable calculus, linear algebra and introductory statistics. If you're gonna to apply to our PhD program, we often like to see a relevant master's degree, but we do still accept you if you don't have a master's degree. We're still interested in individuals directly from, from undergrad too. So please don't let that um, dissuade you from applying to our program. And we like to see advanced calculus, but it's not a required um, prerequisite. You can actually take it during our program. So it's useful if you have advanced calculus or other math and statistics courses or programming courses, um, but those aren't required in your application. So in terms of putting together your application, there's, we'll go over the dates a little bit later, but they're primarily due in December, at uh, the very beginning of December. But you should start working on that now if you're not already and you're interested in applying. What we really like to see is why you're choosing biostatistics. So you could choose math, you could choose statistics, you could choose computer science. Why is it biostatistics that you're interested in? And even more specifically, why the University of Michigan? If you can personalize your, uh, your statements of purpose, you know, that's going to be really, really helpful for us and for other programs if you're applying there. It's really helpful in your statement of purpose if you can describe your background, your current and your future goals. And if you have any specific areas of interest for research or specific faculty you'd like to work with, um, you should include that as well. You don't have to have a specific area that you're really interested in, but if you do, that's, that's great. And you can match it to the program. Try to write clearly and well. Um, it's really important to start those statements of purposes early and to get other people to look at them and to give you feedback on them. Um, so make sure that other people can understand them, they know what you're writing, and they also think that you're making these points clear. For your letters of recommendation, it's really useful if you find at least two in, so you have to have three of these. And we like to see at least two of them from either professors or individuals who you work with that can comment on your quantitative skills, your mathematics or statistics or computation or research skills. Um, so if you did a summer program, um, that would be great. If you have a professor of mathematics or statistics, if you are in industry working and you have a, um, you know, your boss who is quantitative and can talk about your skills, those are all really helpful and great letters of recommendation. It's important to ask those people early. Um, so again, these are due in December. And while it might seem too early right now, it's never too early to ask um, an individual. So you want to start thinking about those if you haven't already. And um, it's nice if you can give some of your other materials, like your transcript and your statement of purpose, to those individuals who are writing those letters for you. If for whatever reason you happen to um, have not done well in a specific semester or you needed to take time off, and so there's sort of like an unexplained gap somewhere. Um, you know, we've all had a relatively tough time with COVID over the last year and a half. If there's anything that looks a bit different on your, um, on your transcript or in your application materials that is due to a specific reason, it's really helpful to actually explain that and, and to let us know the circumstances so that we can fully understand what's going on in your application. So a question I get a lot is, so what are the most important parts? Is it, is it the GPA? Is it my letter of recommendation? Is it the statement of purpose? You know, on the admissions committee, it's a very holistic process. We're thinking about your entire application considering all of those pieces. They're all incredibly important. So there's not one thing that you're gonna be able to just ace and get through. We really wanna see the whole package and consider all of these pieces together. I'm noticing some questions in the chat, so I just want to make sure that I'm not missing anything um, or I can answer it as we go. 
So Kelly, so I'm trying to yeah. I'm trying to respond oh, to them, and I think Nicole is too. So okay, excellent. Okay, great. If you want to stop me and ask them, just just please do, Nicole or or Vermar. Sure. Thank you. All right. So those are a few application tips. I'm happy to talk more about the application, or um, you can ask more questions in the chat um, if you have additional questions. Let me tell you about last year's admissions process. So last year we had 688 applications across both our MS and MPH and our PhD degrees. Um, you can see that the about two thirds of those were for our master's programs and one third or 260 of those were for our PhD program. Out of all of those 688 applications, we accepted 94 master's students and 23 PhD students. Of our 94 master's students, 16 of those were fully funded, meaning that they had their tuition and um, stipend and benefits for them. And there were 13 individuals who had partial funding. These are generally through tuition scholarships. Our 23 PhD students were fully funded, again, meaning that their tuition benefits um, stipend um, comes along with that. And of those 23 students, 14 of those were from our from our University of Michigan master's program. So many of our accepted PhD class um, was from our master's cohort. Most of our students come from a math or statistical background, but that's not necessary in order to get into our program. We've also had many students who have a biology or chemistry background. Um, some of them have had a public health background or engineering, business, economics, computer science. Um, there's really a whole host of different backgrounds um, that our students have. So if you have a math or stat background, that's excellent. Obviously, you, you, fit, you check those prereqs off relatively quickly, um, but you could certainly do that from other backgrounds. And we really love to have students from other backgrounds to give us different perspectives and thinking about the science in a different way. Our PhD field, there's not quite as much of a scattering of, ba of backgrounds. Um, you can see that primarily they're from a biostatistics um, program, but we do still have some math and statistics backgrounds or computer science or data science. As Bramar said, you know, you think of a research area, we've got an expert in it in our faculty and among our students. There's such a wide range of research areas that you can study at the University of Michigan, and that's one of the most wonderful things about our department. We have, as of, you know, as everything has been um, coming up, big data, data science, we've got that. We've got computationally intensive methods. We've got people who are experts in big data and, and statistical genetics and, and imaging. We also have some individuals who wrote the book on survival and missing data, right? We have some of the utmost experts in these fields and just across so many fields. Um, we have both Bayesian and frequentists in our department. So whatever the flavor you want, we, we got it here. Um, it's just such a great, great department for so many opportunities. As we've been going across these more traditional and even more innovative areas of research for biostatistics, right? In the last year and a half, as COVID took over, as Bramar said, so many of our faculty and students pivoted and worked on this research from clinical trials to looking at um, data of wearable sensors and smartphone information to um, creating an app to help decide if we should treat patients for their cancer or hold off because the risk was too high, um, bringing them into the hospital. There's so many projects, all of this is online um, and just really quite interesting how current and up to date, right? That we're, we're that so many of our faculty and students are, are doing research that really matters and is making a difference. Okay, so that was a little bit of a recap from what Bramar said, but let me get into the meat of it, right? You're really interested in, do I do a master's? Do I do a PhD? What can you tell me about these programs? So we have a master's of science and a master's in public health um, for our master's programs. They're really quite similar, but there's a few differences there. Um, they're both about two year programs that are 48 credit hours over four semesters. They're primarily, filled with biostatistics courses. 
I'll show you the core courses um, in, in the next slide or so. But there's also an epidemiology requirement and a small public health requirement. And then we hope that you fill your other credit hours with some electives, either in statistics, computer science, uh, epidemiology, just to fill up your well-roundedness of biostatistics and public health knowledge. The thing that's different about a master's in public health is that um, you're required to have an internship opportunity. So in the master's of science, it's not a requirement. However, most of our students do get some sort of internship during a summer. Um, they find that via their own means. In the Master's of Public Health, this is actually part of the learning and professional degree. Um, so that's the difference, the main, a main difference between these degrees. The goal with the master's degree is that you're coming out of this ready to tackle data. Um, you have that background knowledge, the methods, the theory, the application, and you're going to be a phenomenal team member to tackle, to turn that data into action. So you're gonna learn all of those skills through our core coursework and through those electives. We have these main courses um, that is a series of our probability uh, theory and statistical inferences course, that's 601 and 602, coupled with our statistical methods or more data analysis courses of Biostat 650, 651, 653. Um, and it culminates your two years of your in your master's really culminates with this capstone course that we call Biostat 699. This is the analysis of biostatistical investigations, and it's really where you integrate all the knowledge you've learned over the two years in the master's. You get real data sets, you get to analyze them, you write up reports about them, you present about them. It's really a great um, experience for what you would do in the working world. Outside of those core courses, you take at least 12 hours of biostat electives. So those could be in big data, they could be in survival analysis, clinical trials. Um, and then you can take additional electives outside of biostatistics. So if you wanna take University of Michigan statistics courses or computer science courses or epidemiology courses, um, those are all there for you to sign up for as well. As Bramar mentioned, we have this amazing opportunity in our master's program to concentrate in health data science. So this is what we call a master's of science subplan. You're accepted into our master's of science program. And after your first year, you can declare that you're interested in this health data science concentration. Essentially what this is, is it, just, it defines all of your electives so that you're taking the core courses within our master's programs and then all of your biostatistics electives have to do with big data analytics um, and computation. So this is really combining statistical methods and computing to analyze large scale health data. This is so important right now. We have the ability to collect such big data and yet not enough people that know what to do with it. Um, so it's amazing opportunity if you're really in a job. Is there a question? Okay, so we have, we've developed a series of um, new courses over the past few years that have been really popular and um, just so excellent in data management, computing, modeling analysis, and interpretation. These classes are available to everyone. So even if you are not, you don't declare the sub plan, you don't wanna have a concentration in health data science, these classes are open to you. You can take these classes, you can gain these skills, um, even if you don't, get the actual concentration. This program is primarily targeted for those who want to um, get the MS and then go out into the world and uh, be an amazing team member um, analyzing big data. So it is possible to go on to a PhD as well, but this is a really phenomenal program that's gonna really get you um, the great skills for the job market. So we take, in this program, you take the core courses from our masters of science, um, and then we've basically outlined your electives um, that are the courses as numbered here, which you can see that really have to do with analytics, data analytics, computation, um, and machine learning uh, for big data. So our master's program is phenomenal. Um, you, you really, 
it's, it's just an amazing program where you can decide if you'd like to um, go out into the workforce or if you'd like to use that as a um, degree that readies you for a PhD program. The PhD program typically takes about three to four years after you have a master. So if you're coming from undergrad, you know, you'd go through those two years of masters, you'd have an additional year of, of coursework, and then you'd be working on your dissertation for another two to three years. We, so in our PhD program, we'd require um, the master's coursework and then this additional year, we like, we would have you take um, the advanced calculus or real analysis if you haven't already. And then you have this series of um, upper level statistical inference courses along with stochastic processes. And then you can define your electives um, from a, a number of different courses. We have a qualifying exam, which is usually taken after that um, additional year of courses. Um, or right before that year of courses, depending upon where you are in the program. Our qualifying exam has changed over the years due to COVID and we're currently voting on our format for this year. So I don't wanna to say too much about the format of the qualifying exam, but the whole point of the qualifying exam is to integrate your knowledge over all the courses that you've learned, um, that you've taken thus far, to really synthesize that material and to be able to apply it and to show that you have understood it, you um, have a deep understanding, you can apply that information and you're ready for the next step of, of doing research in a specific area. When you're ready for that next step, you pass our qualifying exam, you're ready to choose an advisor um, and work on your dissertation. So usually this takes um, two to four years to complete the dissertation. You're working with a faculty member on a project of interest um, we usually have about three, three papers that go into a dissertation, but it can vary based on your advisor. Um, and the goal with the PhD program is to really have you be a team leader. So we're instilling these research skills um, and leadership skills throughout this program that differentiates you from having a master's degree. As I said, all of our PhD students are fully funded. Their tuition is paid for and you receive a stipend, right? You get paid to go to school. But in order for you to get paid to go to school, you also give us something in return usually. And that's that you're one of these um, positions that you're either a graduate student research assistant, a graduate student instructor, you might be on a fellowship, um, or you can be partially funded via a tuition award. So. The primary source of funding for our students, our PhD and some of our master's students who are funded is via graduate student research assistantships. These are what we call GSRAs. And they're essentially where you're working on it as an apprentice with a faculty member on a research project. So that might be theoretical, it might be developing methods, it might be collaborative, um, but you're working side by side, receiving mentoring from a specific faculty member um, on really interesting projects. We do have some graduate student instructor um, positions. Those are what other people know of as TAs or teaching assistantships. These are mostly our large service courses, so our biostatistics courses for the greater public health school. Um, and we don't have as many of those because we don't have an undergraduate biostatistics uh, program, right? But we do have some of those opportunities. We have two training grant programs. So there's the genome science training program and the cancer biostatistics training program that funds several students. And then we additionally have a few fellowships through our um, through the University of Michigan graduate program, Rackham. And these fellowships are really supporting students to take courses and to do some research. We have had um, the opportunity to give tuition awards in the last few years. I think we've given we've given them throughout, but we've given even more in the last few years. Um, and this is a 50% or a quarter of the tuition amount is directly awarded to the student. So you're not going to be doing research or have a TA position. So you won't have the stipend and benefits, but you will have a reduction in the tuition, um, which can be incredibly helpful to get you to our program. I wanna say a little bit more about our training grant programs because these are really amazing programs. And again, our 
um, something that set us apart from some other departments. So we have two, one being the Genome Science Training Program. This is an NIH funded training grant. It's at the interface between biostatistics, computation, and genetics. And it's a world leading program in its 27th year. This is led by Mike Banky, who is the principal investigator, former admissions chair. Um, and he has really made this just an amazing, amazing program with 49 other faculty across nine departments. It funds 11 students in biostatistics and other students in other programs, sub, a couple other students in other programs. For background of a student interested in this kind of um, training grant, they're really looking for a math major or and a biology minor or a biology major and a math minor. Um, something where you know you have the quantitative skills, but you're clearly interested in genetics and the science behind it as well. This program has such a robust group and experienced group of individuals and such a, a, a nice large community um, that they have so many awesome opportunities, even you know, beyond just the Department of Biostatistics, this program itself is a is an embedded community. And so they have their own seminar series and journal club um, and their own annual retreat and funding to attend meetings, extensive mentoring and tutoring. Um, so this is just a phenomenal opportunity if you are interested in that interface between biostatistics and genetics. We also have a cancer biostatistics training program. Um, this is also NIH funded. It generally supports for PhD or PhD bound students. It combines biostatistics with cancer research. This is uh, the PI is Jeremy Taylor in our department. who's had this training program for quite a while as well. And it has over um, 12 biostat faculty involved in this. So it's really focused on the biostatistics coursework plus some expanded cancer-based um, electives and a seminar. And you usually also have some research assistant experience. They have their own journal club as well and also funding to attend meetings. So it's again, it's a little bit of a smaller community, this cancer training program, but just a phenomenal one as well where you're really getting integrated into the cancer research. There are super strong links with our cancer comprehensive cancer center at the University of Michigan, um, and they're really looking for uh, individuals with a mathematics or statistics major and a clear interest in science and, and cancer. Outside of our formal funding opportunities and ability to do research via the PhD degree, we also have this amazing opportunity called STATCOM. STATCOM is Statistics in the Community, and it's a student-led organization that um, does community outreach. It's actually led by graduate students in biostatistics, statistics, and the program um, for survey methodology at U of M. So it's a really awesome uh, additional community that you can get involved in that is across multiple departments at the University of Michigan. They're essentially doing data for public good, right? They, they're analyzing data. They, graduate students are leading these um, projects free of charge to nonprofit governments and community organizations in the area um, to lead their data organization, analysis, and interpretation. There's just been just some really cool projects that students have done, and they've won some amazing awards for, for um, their organization and the projects that they've completed. Biostatistics is a phenomenal degree, whether it's a master's or a PhD, it just really opens up the job opportunities that you can that you can have. Right. So we have a specific departmental reputation. University of Michigan is well known in the field of biostatistics. Um, it's very clear across a wide variety of areas how important graduate student, you know, getting individuals with these quantitative skills, technical skills, computation skills, um, really just can land you a great job, both in the US and worldwide. Um, our students have, when they've graduated, gone into universities or research centers, worked for government or industry, whether that's pharmaceutical, biotech, or just tech, um, or consulting companies. And we do a lot to try to help our students connect to the job world. So our department has notices of positions and, and we host recruiters at different events. 
Um, we also have a phenomenal career services office at the School of Public Health that does a lot to help place our um, graduates into jobs that they're really going to succeed and enjoy. So just for example, if you want actual data of where our students have gone, right, students have gone into academic opportunities like at the University of Washington or UC Irvine. They've gone into pharmaceutical opportunities like at Lilly or AbbVie. Um, some of our students have gone into the government in places like the FDA or NIH. Um, they've also gone into to consulting places like Deloitte Consulting or Flatiron. Um, just across a wide variety of options, like even at Ford and Google, right? You have this quantitative degree, this biostatistics degree, and, and people know that you have such a strong background. They're really excited to hire our graduates. COVID has, done, has impacted all of us um, so much. Last year, it was um, difficult. It was hard to, to do things in person. This year, we've moved to where we were actually quite fortunate that most of our students um, could come to Ann Arbor this year and are participating in in-person courses. So most of our classes right now are in-person. Um, some of our larger classes are still virtual. Um, but we're, we're really trying to safely get back to a point where we can all be together and, and really enjoy the community. But again, we're, we're doing this in a public safe manner. So some of the larger courses are still online. Um, last year and this year, we are not collecting or considering GRE scores. So not only are they not required, they will not be considered in the admissions process. Um, so there's no reason for our application to take the GRE exam. And like I said at the beginning, it's actually the one good thing about, there are probably several good things, but one of the best things about COVID has been the fact that we've had to pivot to online events. And we have now found that we can connect with so many more individuals in this way. And across the world is just such a exciting event to, to see that some of you are joining from places where you wouldn't be able to get this information otherwise. And so we're so happy that um, we are able to, to do these events and, um, and connect with you. As I said, I was gonna show you the timeline. Um, our application deadline for the master's and the PhD are, is it's December 1st. So um, somehow it's already mid-October. I don't know how that happened. I felt like it was still summer just a few days ago, but it's creeping up on us. Before you know it, we'll be in December. Um, it will be snowing in Ann Arbor soon enough. So make sure that if you're interested in our applications, um, you're working on that, you're working toward that, that deadline. You will hear from us generally by mid-February, our admissions and funding decisions will be made. So you'll, you'll find via letter um, also often via a call from one of our faculty members that you've been admitted to our program um, and we'll let you know if that's with or without funding. Um, your decision is by April 15th to let us know if you're going to come and join our program or not. And if you, after the, those decisions have made, you've committed to our program, um, then afterwards we'll, we'll start working on the funding matches. So if we've promised you funding, then we'll gather some more information from you in that late spring. And over the summer, we'll start matching you with um, faculty members who will be funding you. Um, and you'll work with either through your training program, your training grant program or GSRA or GSI. In late August, um, hopefully we'll all be together in person safely again, um, going over new student orientation and welcoming you to our department. If you have any other questions, it seems like um, the chat's been a little, been pretty busy. Hopefully, you've been getting your answers. Um, but if you still have questions, if you think of questions later, please feel free to email any of us on this um, on the slide right here. So Nicole, who's silently running um, the back end here along with Fatma, um, they have been just amazing. If you haven't spoken to them already, you likely will. If you have any questions about the application process. Um, 
And if you have questions for me, I'm more than happy for you to contact me as well. Although often if it has to do with the application, I just asked Nicole and Fatma. So um, you're more than welcome to, to, to email me, um, but I might be sending you on to them as well. So you can ask us any questions. Um, also, please visit our website. We have a frequently asked questions section um, and just so much information on it as well that you might be able to find what you're looking for there. Um, again, afterwards, so I'll put this up later, but afterwards, this awesome set of faculty will be available via Zoom for appointments. Um, you don't have to have an appointment. You didn't have to sign up. You can just um, we'll get the information to you for their personal Zoom rooms, and you can click in and out as you see fit, along with our students we will have one as well. So with that, um, are there any other questions that I could address before we move on to our student section? There are two questions, Kelly, that I see yes. that we have not uh, addressed. One is that do we apply for funding in our application, or is that an automated process? Oh, excellent question. Um, so that is an automated process. You do not directly apply for funding in any way. Um, as we consider your application, we consider your application for funding as well. So we consider whether we'll admit you and then we consider whether that would be with funding or not. Obviously, if you're admitted to our PhD, that automatically comes with funding. Um, and for the master's, we will consider funding and let you know. And then I see another question, and I think that um, I'm happy to answer this. I'm very interested in genomics research from Chris Paul, uh, but I have little biological experience. Do you really need more understanding of biology? So I think that many of us, we have students from various diverse set of backgrounds, and I have rarely seen that either lack of math background prevents you from doing something or lack of biology background prevents you from doing something. I think if you come with uh, the interest and quantitative skill sets, then we really do a deep dive at a strong training in the substantive matter of interest. And I, it, this has not been a hindrance, Chris. Yes, one of the best things you learn is how to learn on the job. So you can pick up either statistics knowledge, you can pick up biology knowledge, right? You're always soaking up knowledge from one way or another to make sure that you're doing the best that you can at the projects at hand, on hand. All right, thank you so much for these questions. Please feel free to continue them through the chat. Um, the, the students, I know you probably have a lot of questions for our students. Um, please feel free to speak up or, or send your message to the students in the chat and I will hand it over to them now. I think it's I think Shomik's giving the presentation. Okay, I'll hand it over to Shomik. Can you share Shomik or do you need? I need access, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Nicole, do you know how to do that? Okay. Can you do it now, Shomik? Yeah, I can do it now. Okay, Thanks. Great. Okay. All right, um, just wanted to know if my screen's visible. Yes, yes it is. All right, great. Um, so I'll just be starting off with a small introduction and then we can introduce ourselves um, on the panel, if that's okay. All right, um, so um, thank you. Uh, pursuing a graduate degree can have its own set of unique challenges, I guess. And today, what we'll be doing is we'll be sharing our perspective on what it's like being a graduate student here in the department. Um, it's not a long presentation, but if you want the elevator pitch, um, you love it here. I could not have asked for a better graduate school experience. Um, for us, the intention is to be able to provide relevant information on a range of topics that have enhanced our time here at Michigan. Um, hopefully, it will help you find assistance when you need it um, from connections to graduate students within the community um, to tips on how to live in Ann Arbor, um, as well as resources on your personal well-being. Um, but before that, um, I'd like to um, start by, in, here's our panel of graduate students who have volunteered to answer your questions today. Um, so maybe we could start by introducing ourselves. Um, I'll go first and then tag someone. I'm Shomik. I am a third year PhD student in the department and maybe Jenna could go next. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to Perspective Students Day. Uh, my name is Jenna and I'm a second year master's student. 
I'll go next. Oh, just I uh, I'm Ben. I'm a second year PhD student. I finished my master's degree uh, here in 2020. Um, I'm also the co-president of Statcom. So if you have any questions on that, feel free to throw them my way. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a headshot. So. Elizabeth. I, yeah, I can go next. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Chase. Uh, I'm a fifth year PhD student. Uh, I was a direct admit to the PhD program, so I've been here five years. Um, I work with Jeremy Taylor and Phil Boonstra, and I'm originally from Fredericksburg, Virginia, and did my undergrad at UNC, if there are any Tar Heels on the call. Uh, yeah, looking forward to talking with you, and I guess I will tag Ming Bing next. Hello everyone, my name's, my name is Ming Xuan and I'm a second year master student here. Uh, before I came to UMH, I got a bachelor's degree in pharmacy, then I spent two years uh, doing a, a PhD program in uh, medicinal chemistry, but then I uh, come to UMH and, and uh, welcome everyone here and welcome to UMH. Go Blue. Cat, um, do you want to go next? Oh, sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm Kat. Um, I'm a second year PhD student here, and I also did my master's at U of M as well. Um, I did my bachelor's in statistics and economics at U of M. So you could say that I bleed maize and blue. <laughs> um, so if you have any, any questions about Ann Arbor living for me, I'm very well familiar with everything <laughs> right now, having spent nearly, I don't know, like eight years here. So good to meet everyone. Yes, I'm the next. So um, my name is Meng Bing, and I'm a third year PhD student here um, in biostatistics. I did my master's also in the same department, and I did my undergrad in biostatistics from um, UNC Chapel Hill from the same program as Elizabeth. And I, I've been working with um, Jen Kirby, so um, feel free to share me any questions if you have. Hi everyone, my name is Ziyang and I'm a second year master's student here. Uh, I did my undergrads at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and major in statistics. And happy to see everyone here. All right, um, great, thank you so much. Um, so what I'll be doing is I'll be starting with the presentation. Um, it's not long, I'll be talking about a couple of things here. Um, okay, next slide. So um, first off, if you do sign up for um, the program here, you're not just a graduate student in the Department of Biostatistics. Um, we're part of a vibrant school of public health, which is about 1400 graduate students strong. Um, we're also part of one of the best public universities in the country and Ann Arbor has been rated as one of the best places to live in the United States. Um, these communities of the Biostats Department, SPH, the university and Ann Arbor, these overlap and intersect and they play a pretty strong role in shaping our time here in graduate school. Um, I love it here. And the purpose of this slide is to give you an overview of the presentation. So first we'll be talking about the departmental student experience, followed by some information on SPH, the School of Public Health, the university at large, and finally tips and tricks of surviving in Ann Arbor. Um, so here's, um, so we'll be talking about the department first. Um, so as of 2020, um, I know that this is a bit dated. We had a student to faculty ratio of about six. Um, which is better than the SPH wide ratio of nine. Um, the university has a faculty to student to faculty ratio of about 14. Um, we have a very supportive administrative staff as well. Um, and I think the advantage of being part of a community this big is that there's always support if you need it. And on your screen, you'll find the major areas which influence our lives within the department. Um, I just wanted to make sure that this is in no way an exhaustive list, um, but I felt these are probably the ones that we focus on more. Um, as is the case with grad school, um, the program here is pretty exciting, but it does keep challenging us as students. Um, there's academic support in the form of study groups and tutoring. Most of my learning experience outside classrooms happened when I was discussing issues with my peers. And from personal experience, if you're a PhD student and plan to take the qualifying exams, study groups are really helpful, um, and if not a must. Uh, we have support from the library staff as well whenever we have issues with our research. Uh, the department has been very supportive in terms of providing sources of well-being support. We are fortunate to have Andrea who helps with career as well as personal guidance. 
Um, in addition to that, both the School of Public Health and the University of Michigan have embedded well-being resources as well as crisis support. Um, we have amazing computing resources led by Dan Barker. Um, the department has its own high performance computing cluster, which I think is amazing and it's really cool. Um, it organizes regular workshops on students to brush up on their programming skills. A lot of the work that we do both in the MS and in the PhD program involves using and developing analytical packages, either in R or Python. And I think that there's a great deal of support for that as well. Um, the students do try their best to engage with community. Uh, STATCOM, for example, is a community outreach program that offers the expertise of graduate students free of cost to NGOs and community organizations in the areas of data science. Ben here is affiliated with them and will be happy to answer your questions. Um, we also have the Biostatistics Student Association, which organizes social events and provides students an opportunity to get together outside class hours, and they've always been really good fun. Um, for the brown bags, we have invited speakers talking about anything, literally, um, from available de departmental resources to computing skill workshops, external job opportunities, and so much more. But all of that is in a casual lunch environment. Um, the Alumni of the Month series is another really important way for us to learn about career paths that one can take after the degree here is done. Um, it's really cool, in my opinion. You get to see accomplished individuals doing work that's meaningful and matters to them. And you can think to yourself that, hey, that could be me one day. And that's a good thought to have. Um, representation is of great importance here. Almost all the committees within the department have student members. Uh, students' feedback is solicited, um, and the department really does try to get our feedback within their loop to be able to make changes as and when needed. Um, the peer mentoring committee in particular provides support and resources for students by connecting mentees to mentors, and that process really helps people transition smoothly to graduate school. Um, it sure helped me, and Catherine here um, is part of the peer mentoring committee, and she can help you answer questions if you have any in that matter. Um, finally, we have a very active calendar of events as far as seminars and workshops are concerned. We have weekly seminars on Thursday um, where we have speakers from all around the world, occasional graduate student seminars um, where just graduate students discuss their work. Um, we do know that it can be daunting to talk about your work to faculty members, which is why the grad student is almost always just only for students. However, if you do want to talk to faculty members, the department has that covered as well through faculty lunches, um, although COVID did push the pause button on that. Um, so that's an overview of the student life in the department. And I'm just keeping in touch with um, previous tradition, the parts which are highlighted on your screen, those are good sources of free food. Um, um, next, we'll be looking at um, SPH resources. Um, there's many research initiatives spanning across multiple departments and disciplines. Um, and it's a really good way to participate in collaborative research, which I think is integral to the Michigan Biostats experience. Um, there's a host of student organizations. Um, I'm, I could spend a lot of more time on this, but just want to focus on one. The Public Health Student Assembly is an important forum for graduate students within the SPH. And if you want to represent Biostats um, at the Public Health School of Public Health Forum, it's a really good place. Um, specifically, I will be focusing on two resources that SPH has. The Writing Lab is one of my personal favorites. It's been instrumental in helping me improve my writing and scientific communication skills. And I don't think it's just me. Pretty much everyone whom I've spoken with shares the same experience. The other really helpful resource is the Public Health Careers Office, and that's focused on bridging a gap between our training at school and our professional aspirations. They provide a lot of information on job postings, internships, fellowships, and organize um, group workshops as well as one-on-one -on -one appointments for career topics like writing cover letters or resumes or searching for jobs, negotiating a salary, and so much more. Um, next, we'll be talking about the University of Michigan. Um, it really is one of the best public schools in the country. It's going to take a really long time to list all the resources that it has to offer. Um, there are some web pages that I can point you to if you're interested, but some of the popular ones include the university-wide student wellness program called CAPS. There's a labor union for graduate students and a separate one for lecturers and a free student legal clinic, should you need it. Um, Michigan is really big on sports and there's pretty much every sport that you want to play. And when I say every, I do mean every. Um, on the bottom right corner of your screens is the Michigan Quidditch team who have had a great deal of success in intramural and intra-college competitions. Um, and finally, there's Ann Arbor. Um, it's an exceptionally pretty town and a great place to be a graduate student in. It's consistently been rated as a really good place to live. 
the public school and the library systems are quite good. Um, the public transportation system is pretty decent um, with transfers and a willingness to walk a little bit. You can pretty much get to anywhere across town, especially if it's closer to campus. Um, there's a pretty vibrant nightlife. We, were, we have nice movie theaters, multiple really good auditoriums with great acoustics. The art and culture scene here is also pretty good. The summer months are particularly nice. Um, it's warmer, there are festivals, and the entire town is more colorful than usual. Um, and if it's important to you, um, there's plenty of volunteering opportunities as well, if you'd like to be able to have the opportunity to give back to the community. Um, however, um, I feel like we'd be doing you a disservice if we didn't include a caveat. The weather is really unpredictable, which is kind of like a statistician's nightmare. Um, please bring your coat, bring your swimsuit, bring everywhere, bring everything in between. I'm quoting Ben from his um, presentation last year. Um, I will also share one advice I got from a professor when I first came here. Um, one of the most important things you need to be able to combat the cold is a really good coat and a strong sense of denial. Um, and it's basically been the best advice I've had so far in the department. Um, so yeah, that's it. In terms of the information I had, it's pretty close to a big city, Detroit. Downtown Detroit is about 40 minutes away. The closest international airport is pretty much the same distance from that. We have a train station which connects us to Chicago. So transportation isn't all that bad. Um, how, so that brings me to an end. That's pretty much all the information I wanted to share. Um, I'd like to start by answering just one question that many of you have had, um, and that's what makes this department unique. And for this might sound cheesy, but for me, it's really the people. Um, I've been here in Ann Arbor for about two years now, and pretty early on, it became clear to me that this is where I wanted to be. Um, the image on the top left of your screens is from a Thanksgiving party we had at our apartment. I'm missing because I don't know why, but I, it was at, a, at our apartment. Um, so what I really wanted to say is the people here have made me feel welcome and satisfied. Um, it's not the easiest thing having to move about 8,000 miles away from your hometown. Um, but like I said at the beginning, Ann Arbor feels like a second home to me and the people there play a really integral part to that sentiment. So yeah, that's it from me. Thank you so much. We can take questions next. Thank you so much. So prospective students, do you have questions for our students? Please speak up or put them in the chat. Hi guys, my name is Tia Bafayas. Um, so I currently live in Maryland. So I would be kind of taking a big hop and a skip over to Michigan uh, if I ended up going to the University of Michigan. But um, obviously I'm looking on Zillow, I'm looking on Google Maps. Where do your students typically live? I can answer that. So uh, first I was originally from Virginia, Maryland area. So I feel you on coming further north and the sort of system shock. I really liked it, but I know that's, you know, individual preferences uh, as to where people live. I think we're pretty evenly distributed throughout the city. I think most people try to live fairly close to campus just because I think parking can be a bit challenging. So you sort of want to be connected by either bus or on foot. Uh, for myself, I think I live, I don't know, about 15 minutes walk south of the School of Public Health. I used to live uh, like a mile and a half north across the river. I think Ann Arbor has a lot of like nice neighborhoods. I know a lot of people live west. Um, I think probably the least common direction is east just because there's less housing there. But I think in terms of the north, west and south of campus, you'd see a pretty even spread at, with most people being fairly close. Although we do have some students who commute from, you know, further away. Like um, I think the furthest I'm aware of is like Toledo, Ohio. Uh, but I think that would probably be more for like a much older student who isn't having to come in every day. So, but most people I think are in Ann Arbor pretty close. So yeah, hopefully that helps. Um, that yeah. does help. I, I don't envy the person coming in from Toledo. I have no idea how far that is. It sounds very far. <laughs> yeah, I think she you know came in once a week for her meetings that she had all in one day. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I think with your student ID, you can take the bus system, right? So yeah. you can live a little bit farther and very easily get to campus. Yeah, good catch. I should have mentioned that like all the public transit here is, is free for students. So. so there's a question. What are some of your plans for after graduation? Uh, maybe I can share my plan here. Uh, so I'm a second year master's student here. So after my graduation, my first choice is to stay here and apply for the uh, PhD program here. And 
uh, maybe some uh, other PhD students can share their uh, plan when they have got their PhD degree. I can share. I don't know how much help I'll be because I'm not really positive which direction I want to go. Um, I guess I can share from the perspective of people who I know who have graduated is, um, like Kelly said, there's really kind of no boundaries to the directions that you can go. So I feel pretty comfortable in the fact that I'm not sure if I want to go into academia or I want to go into industry, I want to work in the government, but I feel very confident in the fact that, you know, whatever path I decide to take, I'll be well prepared for it. I'll be able to get a job in that. Um, so I, I guess my, my plans are kind of unsure, but whatever I feel like my plans end up being, I'll be in a good position to achieve those. I see we have one question in the chat about if anyone came in with a non-math background and if they have any insights. I'm afraid I'm not that person, but if anyone else on the call is. Yeah. Oh, I think I can, I can answer this because uh, I got my bachelor's degree in pharmacy and I spent uh, two years doing uh, medicinal chemistry PhD and uh, I kind of quit and come here as a master's student. So uh, as far as I know, there are uh, uh, quite a lot uh, still uh, master's students. They came from like, biology or uh, finance or uh, you know, chemistry, basically uh, a, a, a very uh, a variety of uh, backgrounds. So uh, not the average student here is uh, majorly in statistics or mathematics while they are uh, undergraduates. There's a question about if you could briefly comment on the classroom experience. Sure, I can comment on that. Um, so I have kind of a unique experience because my first year in the program was completely virtual and I'm not sure how the next few years are gonna be, but my guess would be at least some of your courses if you're admitted in the next fall might be virtual. Um, and I just wanna say that I've had a wonderful experience despite all the challenges of the pandemic and navigating a new graduate program um, during COVID. I think that the department did a really, really, really great job at shifting to virtual courses. Um, and now that I'm in normal or in in-person courses too, um, you can just tell how much the faculty really cares about every single lecture they, they give. and. Uh, they really care about your success and, and how well you do in the program and how much you're learning. Um, and I think it really shows in both virtual and in-person classes. So not sure if that answers your experience, answers your question, but that's my experience at least. There's another question about what's your favorite, what's the favorite course you've taken in biostats? Uh, if I had to look if there's any professors in the fall who have taken a class with. So I had no class, which was um, and then there's 625, which is a computing class, which I had a lot of fun in um, because there was like a nice fun group project at the end that I really enjoyed. Um, I, I mean, a lot of the classes are really good. Those have just been my favorites. So hopefully all my other professors don't watch me saying their class wasn't my favorite, but. And I just say, I really like 699. Um, I feel like I, I didn't like it as much while I was taking it, but after I took the course, I think people usually have a more positive and favorable response about it. It's a really cool course to take. Yeah, yeah so I, I agree with, to... oh, sorry. Just go ahead. Mm -hmm. All right, I also wanted to mention 699 as well, my favorite, because it's my, so previously I had like math and biostat background and I learned a lot of, a lot of like methods and theoretically, but I haven't seen a lot of like real applications like or doing it myself. So 699 like gives us a lot of opportunity. I think like four or five projects, which you have to do yourself or with your partner. So you get to see how the methods that you learn in class get to apply in real world data. Okay, uh, I just want to say I agree with Ben. Like I'm not doing uh, so analysis and 625 now, and it's 
whose courses are very interesting and challenging, but uh, still, uh, 801 is so far my favorite course. So, uh, sorry, 675, sorry, 625. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I, I also wanted to mention 698, yeah, um, even though it's, I know it's not offered every year, but I, I really valued the experience. It's kind of like 699, except you get to work with Epi students as well. Um, and I thought that that experience of working across disciplines and collaborating was very helpful for me and kind of challenged me to shift my perspective a bit at some times. Um, personally, I really like 650 because like this course is just um, the introductory level of application course as the graduate level course, but I still find that it reminds me of a lot of details, knowledge about statistical inference and how to use it in our real life. Like actually, it's also the first course uh, required to take in the first semester. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it gave me a, like a, uh, interesting experience to work with my cohort. So there's a question about what do PhD students usually do during the summer? Um, yeah, go ahead. Oh. Uh, I think it's often a lot of like sort of what we do uh, most of the year, except there's no classes. I mean, you're just doing research all of the time. And I think also one part that I think is part of why summer is many people's favorite season is the pace is maybe a little more relaxed. I mean, people are, you know, going to visit family or on vacations and the weather's nice. And so I think people are spending less time in the office and more time kind of doing other stuff. Uh, so it's, yeah, but other than that, I mean, some people do internships. I should also mention that. Uh, that many of our master's students and also a fair number of our PhD students as well. But uh, for people not doing internships, it's just sort of like normal, but you know, in nicer weather and slightly slower pace, I would say. I don't know what other people think. I agree with Elizabeth. I'll comment kind of like not on the work part. I'm from New Mexico. So my first uh, winter here was not fun for me. I was not prepared at all. And I was like, why do people like it here? And then the summer came around and I was like, oh, I get why people like it here. Um, so there's a lot of fun stuff to do, you know, tubing on the river. I play in like a soccer league, you know, there's like all kinds of fun stuff to do. You know, you'll meet people and they'll go on vacations out to some of the Great Lakes, which I had no idea were as big as they were before I got here. But you know, so outside of the work stuff, I think it's, it's such a fun time to be in Michigan. Um, it makes the suffering of the winter worth it completely, so. <laughs> I mean, maybe not completely, but. Uh, the winter is not that bad, guys. We're playing up the winter. It is wintry, but you can get through it. It's a good time to hunker down and get your work done and really enjoy, really enjoy the rest of the, the year. Um, yes, and there are fun things to do in the winter too. Okay, there's another question that said, because um, I didn't really go explain the qualifying exam too much um, because it, the format is is sort of, changing and expanding with COVID, but um, there's a question about, I'm sure the qualifying prep was challenging. Can you shed a little more light on what that experience was like? I can go, I just took it this, this May. Um, so I don't know if anybody else took it at that same period, but I guess I'm probably the most recent one that I've taken it. Um, uh, it's obviously difficult, like you said. I mean, it's obviously like a you know major stepping stone in the program for you, but it's not. I don't think something that people are trying to fail you on or people trying to like trick you on. You know, it's really actually kind of intuitive. Like the stuff that you've learned, if you learned it well enough, you'll pass. You'll be fine. Um, it's yeah, it's actually not that bad to study with it. You just form a group of friends and you go over stuff. It's actually pretty helpful because you feel like you forgot a bunch of stuff and then you remember that you actually didn't forget all of it. Um, so it, it obviously is challenging, but I think in a good way, I think in a way that helps you remember things. Um, obviously I don't know what the format's gonna be like, um, so I won't comment on that, but it, it, it's a good way to you know, connect with your cohorts, a good way to remember the things that um, you thought you had forgotten. And it's, it, it seems scary at the time, but you know, once you're past it, it's, it's, it's a good thing, I think.
So if anybody else has questions, please ask them. But I was going to ask the question um, to our students. What's one thing that you wish you knew before coming into our program? Or what's one piece of advice you would give um, these prospective students in their application process? Maybe that's it. Maybe that's an easier to think of question. Yeah, I think um, for me, the thing that really took a lot of time while I was applying was getting my statement of purpose ready um, because it's really a, it's, you, you have about two and a half or three pages to be able to convince a committee of experts that you are indeed a good fit for the program. So um, as Dr. Kidwell had a lot of pointers about how to get a decent SOP ready, I think that's a really good slide to pay attention to. Um, and of course, um, if you do have the opportunity, try to get people to read your statement of purpose before you send it in, because um, the more iterations you have in terms of more drafts that you're creating, I think the better your statement of purpose gets. Um, and there's really no limit to how good your statement of purpose can be. Um, so yeah, get as much feedback as possible before you do submit. Maybe I can go next. So uh, what I'm going to mention is a pretty trivial thing. I really wish I have a map of the uh, speech building in my brain. But, uh, I already got lost the first day this semester because uh, last semester we were all on Zoom. And uh, this semester is my first time going to a speech building. I really got lost there. And, uh, and then, I, then I got lost for several more times in the following weeks. So. Yeah, I really need to go to a speech building earlier and try to find a classroom. Uh, I think I think I said this this last year at the same event, but it was I guess my biggest advice myself my first year when applying was to not stress out too much. Um, you know, I think it, coming into grad school it's a it's a huge decision. Um, it's very stressful when you're applying. It's very stressful your first couple of years. Um, and I think to myself, uh, I would look back and say, you know, uh, like Shomik said so well in his presentation, there's a lot of great things about Ann Arbor. There's a lot of great things about the University of Michigan, a lot of great things about the School of Public Health. Um, and that includes uh, your personal life too and things like that. And to take those things seriously and to, you know, enjoy your life outside of the department too and take advantage of everything else you're doing. Um, and yeah. Uh, I think my biggest piece of advice would be uh, when I first started graduate school, I was really overwhelmed and I had a really tough transition period. And I, I, I think a lot of it was that I felt like I couldn't do it and that like I wasn't smart enough. Um, but I, so I think my biggest piece of advice is be competent in what you've done and you've, you've made it here and you can do it. And also to take advantage of like the resources that the school provides for you and also the sense of community that the department provides for you. I think like really leaning into that like really helped me. And uh, yeah, I'm really proud of all that I've accomplished, so. Yeah, I totally agree. Just get use of all of the uh, resources around you like career service, like uh, faculty lunch, get every chance to talk with the faculty you're interested in and sometimes uh, also get some advice from them, yeah. Yeah, I also want to echo that. It's like, just try to get as, much, as many resources um, as you can, like whether you are feeling stressful, um, you can find someone to talk to, or like if you need some like computing help, there is someone um, that can like give you a tutorial session and you can also like go to like knock on faculty store if you are like in town or um, just just reach out to people. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, we're at time here. There is a question about taking a gap year. So if any of you, um, if any of the students took a gap year or more and um, you could talk about that, if you could write in the chat. 
that would be excellent if you could respond to Jay um, about how you felt like that affected your admission or your degree. Um, we definitely have students who have worked or taken some time off, um, so that's that's not um, that's not rare for sure. But I did I just want to thank our students so much um, for for all their effort and their presentation and answering their questions. Also, several of them are hanging around and we'll have a Zoom session. Um, so please feel free to hop into their Zoom sessions. I've placed the links for faculty Zoom sessions and student Zoom sessions for anyone to um, exit out of this one and go into one of those. Thank you so much for all of the students, um, prospective students who came to learn about our program, for all of our current students, um, to our chair, to our staff who are here. Um, just so grateful to, to have you all and to welcome you to the Department of Biostatistics at the University of Michigan. And we hope to see your application and you here in the fall. Have a great night, everyone.